The Center for Torah Studies in Moscow presents Magnified and sanctified is his name. This is the beginning of Kaddish, a prayer the Jews say after the death of a close relative. In it, they glorify Almighty God in a belief that the prayer will help the soul of the deceased on Judgment Day. This film is a Kaddish for a man whose entire life was glorification of God, whose whole life was like Kaddish. Kaddish. The great joy over the birth of an only son to the chief rabbi of Kazan, Rabbi Ben Sion Zilber and his wife Leah Gittel, took place in the year 5677 from the creation, a year that abounded in upheavals. And even though the disputes over the historical place of the upheavals rage on, children born in this year of tribulations would long be referred to as revolution contemporaries. Under Abraham's covenant, a little revolution contemporary by the last name of Zilber was circumcised on the eighth day after birth and was named Yitzchak Yosef. His family tree bore the names of great rabbis and one of its branches led back to King David. Under the new government, this origin surely did not promise the boy a bright future. A fierce crackdown on religion was unleashed by the Bolsheviks, particularly by members of the Bolshevik party's Jewish section, Jews who were carried away by socialist ideals and who were remote from the beliefs of their forefathers. They closed synagogues and imprisoned those who taught Torah. A few more years later, they too would be smashed by the Stalinist reprisal machine and would find themselves shut in the same cells where they had sent their brothers by blood who had betrayed neither God nor their people. Those few who would survive would come out of the camps different people. But this would happen later. And so far, a youth group from the Jewish section of Kazan occupies the central room in the same flat the Zilbers live in, under the same roof with the rabbi's family, to be closer, as it were, to the ideological enemy. From a book of recollections by Rabbi Zilber. The central room in our communal flat was a Jewish section club. It was invariably crowded with club members every Saturday and on holidays. Once I came home a Friday night and was going to my room when suddenly I was stopped by one of them. He gives me, I was 11 at the time, some matches and he says, Hey, strike a match or I'll beat you. I didn't do it. But I broke free somehow and I ran away. Little Yitzchak's grandfather, Rabbi Moshe Michal Shmuel Shapiro, who at the time lived in the then independent Lithuania and was a man of great wisdom and virtue, wrote, My dear grandson Yitzchak Yosef, we, your grandfather and grandmother, are worried that you live in such a cold climate. We appeal in our every prayer to God for you to remain a believing Jew who knows Torah. To protect him against the cold climate, Yitzchak's parents chose not to send the boy to a comprehensive school, which under the Soviet system of compulsory education constituted rebellion against the regime. Along with Chumash, Talmud, and Jewish law, his father taught him mathematics, physics, and Russian, rarely resorting to the services of a private tutor. Unbelievably, the would-be graduate of physics and mathematics faculty and so promising a scholar spent not a single day at school. From a book of recollections by Rabbi Zilber. In the times of the Maccabees, the Greeks introduced the Gezeris, a code of rules banning circumcision and the Sabbath and Jewish holidays and the study of Torah. Rules that outlawed the Jewish faith itself. But three years later, the Jews mounted a rebellion and won. But in Russia, the persecution of Jews lasted for more than 70 years. And if Jews could flee other countries from Soviet Russia, there was no escape. Yes, but I believe, I believe. 
Yes, but I believed in the coming of the Mashiach. That is, you know, what can be expected daily? But everything went bust. I remember a dream I saw in Kazan of myself in Jerusalem. A dream. I was dreaming. I remember someone singing me a song in my dream. And I remember the tune. Lead us to your city of Zion. To Jerusalem, where your temple is in eternal joy. And I saw myself in Jerusalem. And who was singing? I don't know. A voice. <laughs> in a dream. Every day. We knew it would come to an end one day. Bar Mitzvah. The day a Jewish boy turns 13. The day he comes of age. From now on, the commandments become mandatory, and he bears a responsibility for himself. On this day, they organize a celebration for joining the ranks of followers of the Creator's laws marks an important occasion for all Jews. For Yitzhak Zilber, Bar Mitzvah occurred in 1930 and was celebrated by about 40 people, an unheard of number in those days. 13-year-old Yitzhak addresses those present with words of Torah. After several days, the authorities evict the Zilbers and the family is literally left out on the street. That was how the last Bar Mitzvah in Kazan ended. The next one would take place only after several decades of oppressive darkness. From a book of recollections by Rabbi Zilber. Our family belongings, including old books and rare manuscripts, after having been thrown out, were piled up on the pavement. It was raining, and I asked an elderly woman from the nearby block to keep the books at her place for a month or two. And sometime later, we found a flat and I came to pick up the books. Oh, sorry, the lady said. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was cold, and I threw the books into the furnace to keep warm. She had burnt all our books. The murder of Kirov and the subsequent reprisals sent the country into yet a deeper turmoil. The situation in the Jewish community was terrifying. The believers didn't know who reported on them. At times, informers were people you'd never think were capable of it. It once came to a point when not a single member of the community dared to read from the Sefer Torah for fear of being reported. The scroll lay in a prominent place in the synagogue and no one dared to touch it. Yitzchak, who had just turned 13, could stand it no longer and made a step forward. That was how he first read Torah to the community. As Yitzchak grew older, it became clear he had to choose an occupation. From the age of 14, he tried a whole string of occupations. He tried photography, he tried working as a security guard, then as a watchmaker, but it was all useless. Everywhere they required him to work on Sabbaths. His mother then suggested, you go take lessons at university. And on Sabbaths, he would only listen and not put down anything in writing. Years later, as he was on his way to Israel, the officials asked Yitzchak about his profession. Rabbi Yitzchak smiled and said, it was Shomer Shabbos, a Sabbath observing Jew. And indeed, he didn't mind which job he did, as long as it gave him the chance to observe Sabbath. So, a man with no elementary education and of non-proletarian origin at that, by a sheer miracle, finds himself in the physics and mathematics faculty of the University of Kazan, a university that prided itself on nurturing the leader of the revolution. While at the university, Yitzhak Zilber had to keep his performance at a lower level because he feared that his high grades would surely win him a Lenin scholarship, which he was afraid would bring too much attention to his personality and make it harder for him to observe Sabbath. In 1939, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany tore Poland to pieces. 
And as the would-be enemies marched in a joint parade, streams of Jewish refugees from Poland flooded the country. The Zilber family, defying its own plight, helps settle the refugees and encourages them to carry on. Many of the refugees who had been devout believers in Poland would crack under persecution from the Soviets. The flickering fire of the Holocaust was starting to rise up in Europe, and it seemed the end of the Jews was close. After graduation, Zilber is sent to work at the village of Stolbischi as a teacher. A few months later, the war breaks out. From a book of recollections by Rabbi Zilber. A Jew prays three times a day, in the morning, after midday, and at night. In Stolbischi, praying was a problem no matter when. I couldn't pray at home because I shared a room with the owner's kids. And suddenly I discover the entrance doors to the school are unique. I've never seen doors so wide in my life. You step in behind a half door and no one will find you. Blessed is God Almighty who created the doors with such wisdom, I told myself. And I began to pray behind a half door. Rabbi Yitzhak fought in did not end in Berlin. In the main battles, we get to come. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The Jews believe that a man grows into maturity in the full sense of the word only after he has found the second half of his once divided soul. The second half was awaiting Yitzhak in Kubyshev, in the devout Jewish family, the Zeidmans. Her name was Gitileya. All Jewish history is actually one big story of deliverance, and Rabbi Yitzhak's marriage is no exception. A few days before the wedding, he was stopped on the street by a policeman and under the pretext of breaking traffic rules, he was taken to a police station. On the door to the room into which Zilber was pushed, there was a sign that read, Smirsch, Death to Spies, Military Counterintelligence. They beat me up all over, broke my glasses and nearly broke my teeth. And I was thinking of my mother who was traveling to Kubashev by boat. My mother going to her son's wedding, but finding him in jail instead. She suffered from a weak heart, and only a year had passed since my father's death. So I started praying to God to show mercy on my mother. I was her only son, and if they put me in jail, what would become of her? I don't know what happened, but by Friday evening I was released, and the wedding went ahead, as planned. The heavens must have heard me and taken pity on my mother. Naturally, the Soviet authorities didn't consider marriage a sufficient reason to end the obligatory work contract, and the newlyweds would be living apart for years after marriage. And it was only due to persistent effort of Shlomo Vovsi, better known by the name of Solomon Mikhoyls, lead actor and director of the Jewish theater and chairman of the Jewish anti-fascist committee, that Gita was transferred from Kubyshev 
to Kazan. Several more years would pass, and the murder of Solomon Mikhoils would mark the start of a Stalin terror campaign against Soviet Jews. In a country of officially sanctioned atheism, service to God required more and more subtle secrecy. And sooner or later, the ever-vigilant authorities were bound to get at the unruly Jew, Zilber. But unlike others, Rabbi Yitzhak went to jail, not on political, but on criminal charges. And that again was due to his kind heart. He had agreed to hide bonds that belonged to a man he knew. And when they were uncovered in a search, he took the blame. Why? It probably saved him from a far more serious trouble. Soviet Jews were in for a lot of agony. And staying at large would get Yitzhak into greater danger. Indeed, the Creator moves in mysterious ways. The Rambam says, every Jew must learn Torah, poor or rich, sick or healthy, young or old, even a beggar pleading for alms, and even one with family burdens. Everyone must make the time to learn Torah day and night. Great sages of the Talmud earned their living by menial labor. They carried water, cut wood. The Torah was with them at all times. In a labor camp, not to work on Saturdays, I carried water from a river all week. How would I find time for Torah? And I found a way. If I walk at my usual pace, it takes an hour. If I run like crazy, I'd say 15 minutes every hour. So I run. Grab the buckets and run. 45 minutes every day. In January 1953, the Central Press publishes a TASS report about the arrest of a group of saboteurs among doctors who allegedly intentionally pronounced wrong diagnoses and prescribed wrong treatment to prominent political and military figures in order to eliminate them. Most of the group were Jews. The trial against saboteur doctors was set for March 6th, but the verdict had been known in advance execution by hanging on Red Square in Moscow. Right after the trial, Stalin was planning to deport all Jews to Siberia and the Far East. Many of the Jews would die along the way, some from the cold and some from the righteous anger of the people. That night was Purim, the 14th of Adar. I had found 15 Jews and was telling them about Purim how an order to kill everyone was issued and how they were saved. One of them, Isaac Mironovich, attacked me, nearly with fists. He says, you're telling us of what happened more than 2,000 years ago. But you tell me where Almighty God is now. Six million have been killed, and there'll soon be only ashes left of all the Jews in Russia. And to this, I tell him, Yes, you're right. Stalin wants to do away with all Jews, but he won't be able to do that. He says, but how? Stalin accomplishes everything he plans. And I say, he's no more than Basavadam. In Hebrew, a man is called Basavadam, flesh and blood. As long as the blood is flowing, he's alive. We never know what will happen to us in the next half hour. A prisoner of correctional labor camp number four, Zilber pronounces these words at 7.50 p.m. on February 28, 1953. And exactly half an hour later, the great Stalin suffers a brain hemorrhage at his dacha near Moscow and loses his ability to talk. On March 5th came the official announcement of his death. Not only had Stalin's death stopped the genocide against Soviet Jews, soon afterwards the government announced amnesty 
and many innocent camp prisoners were let out. Among them was Yitzhak Zilber. This period in Soviet history is known as the Thaw. The personality cult was denounced. Most of those who'd been subjected to Stalin's terror were rehabilitated. And even the Iron Curtain was lifted somewhat for foreign tourists. However, the Soviet regime was in no hurry to demonstrate more tolerance towards religion. Official synagogues remain under the control of the KGB, and Torah and Hebrew are still outlawed. A major concern of the Zilber family at the time is raising their children. Jewish tradition requires that a boy take up religious education at three. A child is taught Hebrew and learns how to pronounce blessings. When Rabbi Yitzchak returned from the camp, his son Ben Sion was four. And they had to catch up on his studies. Actually, there were still a lot of Jews in the Soviet Union who had preserved the knowledge of Jewish tradition which they had inherited from their parents. Many had studied in Cheder and even in Yeshiva, but few had enough courage to pass it on to their children. In 1956, the Zilbers applied to leave the country. The Soviet authorities viewed an intention to leave as treason against the motherland. Naturally, the family was denied emigration, but the application was filed at the emigration office every year. With such persistency that in 1960, the KGB chose to get at the family in earnest. Right out of the blue, the Republic's newspaper, Soviet Tartaria, publishes an article in which the Zilbers are lambasted for religious obscurantism, and what's more horrible, for abusing their own children who were suffering from their parents' fanaticism. Publications of this kind were bound to trigger response from the Soviet public. And soon afterwards, the school's management held a staff meeting. It took place in this room on January 6, 1960, and lasted from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. More than 30 people spoke. They say you believe in God. Is that true? Yes. Think hard. Comrades who've been working with you for so many years and studied with you at the university hope you'll reconsider your stand and will choose to abstain from hasty decisions. I believed, believe, and I shall believe. And what will you do when we will build communism? I'll work wherever possible, but I shall stay a believer. This is impossible. Engels has said it clearly that there'll be no believers under communism, not a single one. I will remain one. My heart shrank when I heard in what condition Zilber's kids live. Their parents don't buy them meat because it's forbidden. On Saturdays, they're not allowed to write. And before and after meals, they're forced to drone some weird prayers. Childhood, such a happy time when children go skiing and skating, walk in the park and go to the woods, bathe in the river. But these kids' childhood is poisoned. As a woman, a teacher and a mother, I suggest that we turn to our dear Soviet government with a request to deprive Isaac Yakovlevich Zilber and Gita Vinayanovna of custody. The children should be sent to an orphanage as far away as possible to protect them from this harmful influence. We'll raise them as worthy Soviet citizens and they'll thank us for that hundreds of times. Comrades, who votes in favor? On the same day, a similar court of law took place in the school where Gita worked. She was advised to divorce her husband, and for that, she was promised a job, a three-room flat downtown, and a peaceful life. The story had left such a strong impression in Kazan that the chances to get a job after it were few, if any. The thought of someone coming and taking the kids away was horrifying. It was clear the authorities were forcing Zilber to publicly renounce his faith. Some advised him to concede. Why not do so? Everyone will understand it's a forced lie. And a Russian neighbor, Antitosia, said, If you, Isaac Yakovlevich, will renounce God, then who will stay with him? The culmination of the hunt was a subpoena to report to the State Security Committee, which meant 
the KGB was determined to pursue the Zilber case to the end. Rabbi Yitzchak was fully aware that no one could be sure that he would leave the KGB building once he had crossed over the threshold. That night, he gets on the train to Moscow. Every minute, he's prepared to be arrested and taken out onto a remote platform in some desolate place. The train arrives safely at the Kazan railway station, but Rabbi Yitzchak stands alone in an empty carriage, still expecting someone will come for him. From Moscow, he heads for Sukhumi, and from there to remote Tashkent. There was a big Jewish community in the city where he found people ready to risk giving shelter to a man persecuted by the authorities. For several months, Rabbi Yitzhak knew nothing of what had become of his family. In the meantime, Gita was summoned for questioning, where they shouted at her, demanding she disclose her husband's whereabouts, naturally, with no result. And since the KGB lacked sufficient grounds to put Zilber on the nationwide wanted list, the case had to be closed eventually. Jews believe that whatever happens in the world follows a subtle hidden logic. That logic is in the hands of God. But when it is revealed to us, we see how merciful he is to all of us. They had to move to Tashkent because of fairly unpleasant circumstances. Otherwise, they'd never left Kazan. As it turned out, the conditions for devout Jews were much better in Uzbekistan. You could keep Jewish books at home. And even though, secretly, those willing to were able to learn Torah. Staying away from work on Sabbaths was easier. You lost income, but you didn't lose your job. And most important, from Uzbekistan, it was easier to leave for Israel. They say the Jews came out of Egypt by virtue of Jewish women. The Zilbers left the Soviet Union due to determination demonstrated by Gita. One day, she grabbed her younger daughter by the hand and went to the KGB on her own. Why won't you let us leave? If we did anything wrong against the state, then arrest us. If not, let us go. We can't stand it any longer. A month later, the Zilbers were granted permission to leave. Speaking in America years later, Rabbi Yitzchok said, If angels had descended on the world in 1917 and had witnessed the revolution, the rampage of Petluras, Dienikins, Machnos, and Kolchak's gangs, the civil war in which 300,000 Jews were killed, the arrival of the new government which immediately closed Jewish schools and put those teaching Torah behind bars, the reprisals of 1937, when millions were shot for no reason or thrown into camps from which very few returned. The Hitler occupation, when 90% of Jews from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarusia, and Ukraine were exterminated. The famine in Leningrad, and after the war, the accusations of cosmopolitanism. The trial against Dr. Saboturas, I can assure you that nothing would have remained of those angels. family emigrated in 1972. When Rabbi Yitzchak first saw Jerusalem, he was 54. However, in the very first days of their arrival, the Zilbers had to acknowledge how the Israel of their dream 
differed from the country they had arrived in. We arrived on Tuesday. And on Saturday, as I walked along the street, I see a man come up to his car, intending to drive. I tell him, uh, Sorry, but it's the Sabbath. And he says, So what? At one point, there was even an urge to return. Back to a cold, repressive Russia, but not to see the land of Israel. Like this. The heart prompted, run away. But the mind reasoned, Yitzchak, you are in the land of Israel. You're at home. You may not like everything in your home, but you have no other. And if it's not you who can change it for the better, then who? In those days, Rabbi Yitzhak meets the Gera Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael Alter. The Rebbe heard Yitzhak described as a man who had spent 50 years in Russia and lived in faith all along no matter what happened. As you conducted yourself there, he told Yitzhak, live here the same way without changing anything. It took time for the words to sink in. On the one hand, religious life in Israel is throbbing with thousands of devout Jews and hundreds of yeshivas and synagogues. And on the other, in the 70s, when tradition oblivious Soviet Jews started to arrive, there was no one to lead them. They knew nothing, but felt an inexplicable craving for the faith of their forefathers. After breaking free of Soviet slavery, they were spiritually thirsty. Many wanted circumcision, but neither the absorption ministry nor the rabbinate was prepared for that. According to Torah law, it is a sin to postpone circumcision when it's possible to perform it. So, every hour counts. So I went to a friend of mine, a urologist, Yaakov Tsatskis, who had performed circumcision when still in Moscow. Come on, Yaakov, do it. Just like in the Soviet Union, they started to perform circumcisions in a private flat. Between two and five were done on a weekly basis. After the operation, Rabbi Yitzhak often took the patients to spend the night at his place and used the time to talk with them about Torah. That was the beginning of what might be seen as his major life occupation, the return of new repatriates from Russia to the Jewish tradition. Those who found themselves at the Zilbers were people of both rightist and leftist views, and it was important to see that they wouldn't fight. But Rabbi Zilber was far removed from politics. The one issue that worried him all his life was, what does the Creator expect of me now? Where shall I channel the strength with which he endowed me? As he had done in the USSR, Rabbi Zilber taught math at school, studied Torah during his breaks, and dedicated the rest of his time to others. Many of the Zilber's guests became believers over time, and some even grew to become rabbis. One after another, Rabbi Zilber opens clubs to study Torah in Russian in different parts of Israel. Unlike in Russia, where he succeeded in completing the study of Talmud several times, in Israel he chooses to discard profound learning in favor of explaining elementary Torah rules to Jews from the Soviet Union who were remote from the Jewish tradition. The Torah says the exodus of Jews from Egypt was accompanied by the fall of idols in the then most powerful empire. Sages say the destruction of statues ran parallel to the collapse of the existing system and the previously reigning ideologies. The infamous collapse of the Soviet Empire brought more work to Rabbi Zilber. Hundreds of thousands of Soviet Jews, all of them speaking Russian, seek permanent residence in Israel. The seeds planted by Rabbi Yitzhak fell on a new good soil, and many of his pupils become teachers in the period of the new exodus.
Rabbi Yitzchak is beginning to give classes in Russia. Over and over he opens the Pentateuch with Rashi's commentary at Torah Chaim, Yeshiva near Moscow, to talk of the eternity of the Jewish people. And he illustrates his story with his own life's experiences. In Kazan, hundreds come to meet Rabbi Zilber. In the very room, he had once been sentenced by a society to be deprived of child custody. And the comrades who then spoke at the meeting, where are they now? Hear me, you who know what is right. You, people who have my law in your hearts, do not fear the reproach of men nor be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, the worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, my salvation through all generations. Wise men teach us that the death of the righteous is like twice destroying the temple. When the temple falls, God's presence in the world remains. When a righteous person goes, the world is stripped of the quality of the Creator which He brought to us. Rabbi Zilber's soul left this world on the 8th of Av, the year 5764. His funeral took place on the 9th, the day that marks the destruction of the temple. They say, true history comes not from the events in newspaper headlines, which are then transferred to the pages of textbooks. True history unfolds from the lives of righteous men like Rabbi Zilber. And if, according to legend, every generation has 36 hidden righteous men whose virtues keep the world together, here is one about whom you'll know something from now on.